Good morning and welcome back to this series of tutorials on plan simulation. In the previous video, we solved our first exercise using three of the most important objects for modeling any process, the source, the station, and the drain. Today, we will learn to use some more objects that will allow us to simulate more complex processes. If this is the first video in this series that you are watching, I recommend that you watch the previous ones in order, as many concepts will not be explained again. That being said, let's expand the exercise we did in the previous video by making it a little more realistic. We are going to add more than one type of part, which is usually quite common in real production processes. So we will have two products on the same line, A and B, with batches of 100 pieces of each type succeeding each other. Also with different process times depending on the type of piece and with setup times between them. The setup or preparation time represents the time necessary to start up a machine that goes from producing one type of part to another type. For example, because the dies have to be changed, or because it has to be reprogrammed. So, as we are expanding the previous exercise, the first thing we are going to do is generate a copy of it so we can keep it. We simply right-click on the exercise folder and select Duplicate. Then right-click again and rename it as Exercise 2. We could also have made a copy by dragging the folder into basics while pressing down control key. Now is when the importance of having generated our own class objects becomes evident. If we open, for instance, the inheritances of the station object, both for exercise 2 and for exercise 1, we see that they are two classes completely independent of each other, and the instances of each frame refer to their own class. This way, we can modify the parents of each exercise without affecting the others, something we could not have done if we always used the default class from the Material Flow folder. The first thing we are going to need to be able to produce two different references in batches is a table. The tables or data tables are found in the Information Flow tab. We are going to create our own class just as we have done with the rest of the objects, and we will instantiate it in the frame next to the source, and we will rename it Sequence. If we open the table, this is what it looks like, a blank grid. We also see how here in the General Toolbar, a new tab appears with the specific options for the tables and lists. We will see all of these functions in more depth in my other series of videos on programming in SimTalk, where tables play a key role. For now, let's close it. Now we are going to configure the source to produce the two pieces in batches of 100 pieces. To do this, we open the Source menu, and we are going to edit the MU Selection drop-down. Then we will define Sequence Cyclical. We see how the MU option has automatically changed to another one that tells us to pass the path of a table. We then drag our table and save the changes. Now if we reopen the table, we see how the format has been automatically reconfigured to be able to define the part creation sequence, where each row in the table represents a batch of different parts. Now we can define the two batches of 100 pieces that we need. Of the four columns of the data table, for now we are going to focus on the first three. In the first column, we must indicate the absolute path of the MU that we want to produce, which in our case will continue to be our own class part. Then it asks us how many we want to create. As we have already said, the batches are 100 parts, so we will indicate it in the number field. Optionally, we can define a name for it, so we are going to indicate that the first batch is made of A parts. Now we simply copy this first row, paste it in the second, and change the name of the second batch to B. If now we play it at normal speed, we will see that we are already producing batches of 100 pieces of each. If you have noticed, although they have different names, both share the same parent class in the sequence table. This means that we are always creating instances of the same class, only that the source object automatically modifies the name attribute to differentiate them. If we open any of these instances, we will see that the name attribute has indeed lost inheritance. If we now execute to the end and extract the reports, we will see that they are now broken down by part type. But if we have not yet defined that the process times vary between both references, 
How can it be that they have different productions per hour? Well, this can be explained because when producing batches of 100 pieces, the simulation has not had enough time with one day to calculate a correct average of the production per hour. If we go to the Settings tab and increase the duration to two days, apply the changes and recalculate, we will see that now the production of 30 pieces per hour that we had in the previous exercise is distributed equally between the two references. The next step will be to define the setup times that are applied when changing from reference A to B and vice versa. The setup time is defined here in the Setup Time field of the Times tab. But we also have the Setup tab, where we can define advanced parameters. The first option allows the setup to be activated automatically when the first reference of a type other than the current one tries to enter the station. The alternative would be to program ourselves a different operation, but it is not within the scope of this course. If we check the second option, we are forcing the setup to be activated not only when the next part tries to enter, but also the station has had to be emptied before and the next part cannot enter until it finishes. We are going to activate this option, but for all stations. So let's activate it directly here on the parent. The third option allows us to define a setup time after a certain number of pieces, but with automatic setup activated, we are not interested in this option right now. Finally, we can choose, based on what we want the station to know, that we have changed reference. We will leave it with the default value, which is the name of the MU. Thus, we will define all the setup times in the same way with the rest of the stations. Now that we have defined the setup times, we would have to define that the process times are not constant, but depend on the reference that is being processed. To do this, we are going to need a table again. So we instantiate one and we are going to rename it as Station 1 Times. Next, we open the first station, and in the Times tab we are going to define that the time of process is dependent on a list, and then we drag the table here to the adjacent box. By doing so, it will ask us for confirmation to reformat the table. We click on Yes and save the changes. If we open the table, we will see that it now has four columns. The first three allow each MU that passes through the station to be specified in different ways, and the fourth is the one that defines the process time. In our case, since the references are differentiated by name, we only need to fill in the first column to tell them apart. So we will write A and B, and in the last column the corresponding times. We will repeat this last step with the rest of the stations. At this point, we have already solved the first part of the exercise, but let's go one step further. Now, in addition to get the results separated by part A and B, we also want to be able to differentiate them visually during the simulation. To do this, we are going to create a second class of the part object, and we are going to edit its icons. We duplicate the existing class, and we are going to rename them A and B. Then we open them, and we are going to access the Graphics tab of each one. Here we can define the fill and border colors we want for each path. So let's define different colors. If we now go to the Sequence table, we will see that the MU column appears in red. This occurs because when modifying the name of the class, the path that we specified before no longer exists. So, for both rows, we are going to modify this path with the new name of the class. And, of course, we are going to eliminate this name specification in the Name column. Now, if we press play, we will see that the parts are already being differentiated by color. But what happens if we want to customize the icons even more? Let's go back to the Graphics tab of Class B, and we're going to look closely at this checkbox that says Activate or Deactivate Vector Graphics. This option allows us to adapt the size of the icon to the actual dimensions that we define in the Attributes tab. For example, if we double the length, we will see how the icon adapts automatically. 
This can be useful, but if we want to edit the shape and color freely, we will need to disable this option. By doing so, we will see that the icon is now in the shape of a package. This icon can be edited by right-clicking on the class and selecting Edit Icons. By default, two icons are created, Operational for Normal Operation and Waiting. We can edit both icons using the tools here in the top bar or directly paste an image we want to use. It should be taken into account that the default image has a resolution of 17 by 17 pixels, so any image that we paste should have a similar size if we do not want it to be disproportionate. Furthermore, everything we paint with the green color that is in the final part of the color palette, plant simulation will interpret as transparent. I am going to use two icons for parts A and B, and I am going to eliminate the waiting icon so that plant simulation does not automatically change the icon when changing the part state. Icon editing can be applied to all plant simulation objects in the same way we have seen with this part. With this last step, we have finished configuring the model. Now we are going to run it at low speed, and we are going to pay attention to these small circles that appear above the stations that change color. Plant Simulation calls these indicators LEDs, and they are a real-time visual representation of the status of each station. If you want more information, you can open the program's help and search for LED. Specifically, the ones we have seen are the material flow objects, but as you can see, there are more types. Now let's run the model to the end. As I'm showing you, the productions per hour of references A and B are no longer the same, and also, they have decreased compared to the previous video, where we did not have setup times. So how could we improve these productions without changing any of the timings? If we analyze the times, it is evident that the drop in production is due to the excessive setup time that we found in the last station. Therefore, one way to increase it would be to make the batches as large as possible, although we would also need more simulation time to be able to calculate the average as well. But if that is not possible either, there is a simple way to solve this problem. Let's imagine that we can store the pieces that leave Station 7 in a container while waiting for the setup at Station 8 to finish. And then we can consume from that container until it is empty, and we can operate at a normal flow. In this way, the rest of the stations would not be stopped for 30 minutes for each batch change, and we would increase productivity. This is precisely the purpose of the buffer object found in the Material Flow folder. If we open the menu, we will see that the tabs are very similar to those of the rest of the objects, but in the Attributes tab, it allows us to define the capacity to store parts and the type of storage. There are two strategies. The first, Q, reflects a FIFO, or First In, First Out system, in which the entry order is the same as the exit order as occurs, for example, in a supermarket queue. The second stack is a LIFO, or last-in, first-out system, where the entry order is inverse to the exit order. Continuing with the example from before, a LIFO system can be found in a shopping bag. The last products we have added will be the first to leave. We are going to leave the configuration at default and insert the buffer just before Station 8. If we press play now, we will see how production has indeed improved, but we could improve even more. If we increase the capacity, for instance, to 15 and run it again, we will see how both the total pieces and the pieces per hour have actually gone up again. Where do we have the boundary then? If we review the data, we will see that the process bottleneck, that is the station with the slowest process time, is station 4 for part A, and Station 3 for Part B, since both need two minutes. Therefore, in the 30 minutes that Station 8 setup lasts, there will be time for 15 parts to accumulate, which will then be progressively emptied, since the process time of Station 8 is much less than the two minutes. Therefore, if we increase the buffer capacity to more than 15 parts, we will see that the productivity indicators no longer improve. With this, we have seen how to create productive flows that include more than one reference, the use of icons and the buffer object. In the next videos, we will see more objects and solve more complex exercises. Greetings, and until the next video.